I'm stolen. I don't... I don't... I don't think that they would have had a chance with the jury if they hadn't been emotional. I absolutely believe that they were terrified. This is a special edition of Dateline NBC with Court TV. The Menendez Trial, the inside story, tonight. An inside look at one of the most sensational murder trials in years. Why did you kill your parents? Because we were afraid. For the first time, the lawyers tell you their strategy. There's nothing more harrowing than having your client on the scene. It's like, it's like putting a baby in the middle of traffic. The jurors tell you why they couldn't reach a verdict. What more does it take? Proof beyond a reasonable doubt. And we'll tell you what it all means and what's next for the Menendez brothers. I would rather eat ground glass for a year than do this trial again. Tonight, watch the case unfold and reach your own verdict. Also, the very latest on Tanya Harding. What will tomorrow bring? And a Hollywood who's who, Dateline's Picture of the Week. Dateline, with anchors Jane Pauley in New York and Stone Phillips in Los Angeles. With Brian Ross, Deborah Roberts, John Scott, Lee Thompson, and Faith Daniels. Now, from Los Angeles, here is Stone Phillips. Good evening from Los Angeles. More than seven months after the trial began, two juries here have been unable to reach a verdict in the case of two young men, Eric and Lyle Menendez, who admit to fatally cheating their parents. Tonight, we've teamed up with Court TV to bring you the most detailed look at the trial. Not just what happened, but what it means. We'll show you the strategies and the mistakes on both sides. We'll take you inside the jury room. What would your verdict have been? And we'll examine what this case says about the judicial system and what it could mean to similar cases. Let's begin at the scene of the crime. Pay attention. Small details often made a big difference to the jury. At this time, we have two uh, deceased persons inside, a male and a female. August 20, 1989, 10 p.m. Jose Menendez and his wife Kitty were in the family room of their Beverly Hills home. Their killers came down the front hall through the French doors and began firing as they moved into the room. Jose Menendez was hit five times, including a round to the back of the head at close range. His wife had ten wounds, one made with the gun against her cheek. I've seen a lot of homicides, but nothing quite that brutal. Blood, flesh, skull. It would be hard to describe, especially Jose, as resembling a human that you would recognize. That's how bad it was. The killers carefully collected the spent shells and left the scene. A scene that deeply affected some of the jurors. I would have held the door open on the gas chamber while the prosecution presented its case. I was that angry at how heinous this crime was. Later that night, the victim's two sons, Lyle, 21, and Eric, 18, called the police. <laughs> okay. You were crying, correct? Right. And at the same time, you were lying right. while you were crying. Is that correct? Right. The call was a hope. A brilliant bit of acting the jury would remember. Four and a half years after the killings on Elm Street and six months after their trial began in this Van Nuys courthouse, the world now knows what police suspected from the beginning. I was just firing as I went into the room. I just started firing. In what direction? In front of me. What was in front of you? My parents. And was Lyle to your right or to your left? Um, he was to my right. You remember firing a very close shot at your father? Um, I believe so. You loaded? At last? Yes. And what did you do after you reloaded? I ran around and 
What's up, my mom? Where did you shoot him? The street door was a Santa Claus. With that kind of graphic testimony, how could the defense possibly hope to win an acquittal? By convincing the jury that the killings were justified. And when we come back, you'll see how the defense put the victims on trial. And later, hear from the jurors themselves. I'm not ashamed of where I stand or what my decision was. Critics would call it yet another not-my-fault defense. But the heart of the defense strategy was self-defense. That after years of alleged sexual abuse, the Menendez brothers were afraid their parents were plotting to kill them. Lyle and Eric Menendez went on trial together. But each had his own prosecutor, his own defense team, his own jury. We talked candidly to the lawyers before the mistrial was announced last week, before they could put their own spin on the results. Here now for the first time, the defense strategy. To sum up then what we intend to prove. Eric Menendez was the abused son of wealthy parents. He killed his parents because he could no longer endure their abuse and had to stop it. The Menendez defense was similar to the battered woman defense, which has been used successfully by abused wives who killed their husbands. But this was one of the few times it had ever been offered in such a high-profile case of children killing their parents. Attorney Jack Ford. The defense had to prove was this. Firstly, they had to show that all of this abuse did happen, that they were subjected to this over the course of their lifetime. Secondly, they had to show that because of the abuse, their perceptions were different from other people. To claim self-defense, the brothers had to convince the jury that they genuinely believed they were in imminent danger that night. The brothers said they felt their parents were actually plotting to kill them that their father was afraid his sons were about to blow the whistle on years of physical and sexual abuse. I told him that I would tell everybody all I tell I would tell everybody everything about him. I would tell the police and that I would tell the family. And uh, I was I was yelling and it was pretty um I may have said some more things and swore at him or something. What happened? How and, did you stop? And then he said, um, he said, we all make choices in life, son. Eric made his, you've made yours. And then he just looked at me and he got up to leave. What did you think was going to happen? I thought we were in danger. I thought he had no, he felt he had no choice. But to what? That he would kill us. That he would get rid of us in some way. The defense felt it was important for the jury to see the killings through the brothers' eyes. It's their belief. It's an individual belief. And so the real dispute is over what is reasonable. Well, the real fight is over what is reasonable to someone raised normally. And what is reasonable to someone battered and abused is very different. Well, he told me never, ever to tell anyone. And did he ever tell you what the consequence would be of telling anyone? He would kill me. And my daddy closed the doors, and I didn't believe that the dad was going to finish any movie or talk to Eric. I thought he was just buying time. And I, I realized that uh, they had been waiting for Eric to get home, like I had been. And I just freaked out. What did, what did you think they were, going, were doing in the day? What did you think was going to happen? I thought they were... Going ahead with the plan to kill us. Court TV's Terry Moran was in the courtroom for much of the testimony. The afternoon that Lyle Menendez took the witness stand for the first time, the atmosphere in the courtroom completely changed. His trial turned around. Did you kill them for money? Is that no? No. Did you kill them because you wanted to pay them back for the way they had treated you? No. Why did you kill your parents? Because we were afraid. It was very strange. Um, it was very dark. Um, he turned off the lights, and it would be very dark, and it would be very quiet, and he would do these things to me. Many of the things Jose Menendez would allegedly do to his sons are too graphic for network television. But for days, 
both brothers testified in incredible detail to acts of molestation and sodomy. He would have me give him oral, oral sex and he would stick the needles or the tacks into my thighs uh, as he was doing this. Even the prosecution conceded that the brothers' dramatic testimony had helped their case. I don't think that they would have had a chance with the jury if they hadn't been emotional. That's just part of how you do it. This is, this is a production. A trial is a production. People say that it's a search for the truth, but I've yet to see a trial that really resembled a search for the truth more than it is a production. The defense team was relieved. There's nothing more harrowing than having your client on the stand. It's like, it's like putting a baby in the middle of traffic. You just hope that the trucks dodge him. To bolster its case, the defense had called experts on sexual abuse okay. and family members who said they heard long ago about incidents involving the brothers. Well, he told me his father was misogynist. his... And he used that word? Yes, he did. He and his dad had been touching each other, and he indicated that it was in his general area. And did you tell Kitty what Lyle had told you? Yes, I told her what he had indicated to me, what he was telling me, what he was showing me. How did she look? Did she look shocked? Or did she, she show any emotion? She showed that she did not believe me. According to the defense, Kitty Menendez was much more than a bystander taking part in both the sexual and psychological abuse of her sons. Did you continue to sleep in her bed around this time when you were 11 and 12? Uh, sometimes. And sometimes, did you touch your mom? Yes. Would your dad be in bed? Sometimes. And where would you touch her? Um, uh, everywhere. For the defense, this kind of testimony was critical. There's a level of craziness here that we're trying to show. I, I don't think the boys told them. Of the anecdotes they told, we easily had three times as many more that we didn't tell because we don't want to go on forever. Kitty was described as an alcoholic, obsessed by her faded beauty and failing marriage, resentful of her children who cut short her dreams of acting. Was there a, a time where you upset your mother as she was uh, preparing dinner and she cut herself? Yes. She pushed me against the glass and she rubbed her hand in my face and said, see what you did to me. Uh, did she get blood on you? Oh, yeah. Her hand was a mess and my face was a mess and I ate dinner that way. Why did you eat them in there? Why didn't you wash it off? I went to wash it off. She said, no, just leave it. Just eat. So it may sound like small things, but it's an endless catalog of small things. Jose was described as a father who ruthlessly groomed his sons for success, even ordering Lyle to get a toupee to improve his chances in business or politics, and as a pervert who preyed on both other women and the brothers. He told me that he was going to train me how not to not to feel pain, not to have to uh, feel the hurt of the pain, and that he was going to eliminate that from my uh, senses, my feelings. And did he also use a knife at any time? Yes, he would. Uh, he had this wooden kitchen knife that he would use to just, he wouldn't be doing anything with sex at that point though. He would just have me sit on the back of the bed he would put a towel under my legs, and he would just cut my, my thighs with the knife. It was all part of a defense strategy to make the jury focus on Kitty and Jose. They painted a picture here of parents who were monsters, and if the jury bought everything the defense had to say, they might say to themselves and then come out and say to the prosecution, you know what, these men were created by these parents, the parents forced them to take their lives, and maybe in a sense they deserved it. As the presentation of the defense spun out over weeks, the prosecution worried it had also taken the jury further and further from the central issue, the horrible deaths of Jose and Kitty Menendez. I think they were very effective in making this case very long, and it's been a long time since the coroner testified. It's been a long time since some of the other witnesses testified. And, uh, and so that, I think that in and of itself has been a problem for the prosecution. The defense attorneys had also introduced these two photographs 
which they say were found on a roll of pictures from Eric's sixth birthday. I think the fact that these heads are cut off and there is such a focus on the uh, genitals is unusual and certainly should create some level of concern about the motivation of the person who took them. He would take photographs of us, um, of um, our private parts. And he ever show you those photos? At this point, because the prosecution knew the thing. outcome was no longer this a sure thing. Okay. The defense has done an excellent job of trying to muddy the water, but this is classic textbook premeditation, and that's why it's supposed to be murder. Despite the stories of sexual abuse, the defense offered very little in the way of physical evidence, a childhood medical record of an injury to Eric's throat, and the prosecution challenged that. So you can't extrapolate at all from that what was the source of the injury, correct? That's correct. And you found nothing else besides the sore throats in his childhood medical history to corroborate a claim of sexual abuse. Is that correct? That's what I just said. Along with expert witnesses, the defense hired consultants and gone with a designer's suit. Had they dressed the brothers for effect in boyish sweaters and button-down shirts? Every single client I ever take to trial wears a sweater and a shirt. Every single one. Because I think suits look ridiculous. And that was it. It was no big task. We didn't hire a media consultant. We didn't hire a style consultant. Nothing. But as the trial moved to a close, the defense team itself came under attack. Keep in mind that this is the best defense daddy's money could buy. The defense took it as a sign the prosecutors were worried. Do you want my interpretation? They're outclassed, outmaneuvered, and outlawed. Was the prosecution outlawed in a case that had been called a slam dunk? When we come back, you'll hear how the prosecution tried to prove that the killing of Jose and Kitty Menendez was nothing short of cold-blooded, premeditated murder. And still ahead, jurors reveal how they judged the case. I didn't vote the way I did because of, uh, of their abuse. When the trial began, the prosecutors were confident of winning convictions. After all, the defense couldn't deny the brothers had shot their parents because of a secret recording of the brothers' therapy session. It seemed to show that the two had carefully planned the killings. So the question was not what the brothers did, but why. Now again, we talked to the lawyers before the mistrial was announced. So remember, you're getting their candid appraisals of what they did and why they did it. Based upon this evidence, it will become apparent that this murder was unlawful, unjustified, and wholly premeditated, and that it was accomplished through a conspiracy into which Lyle Menendez entered with his brother, and that but for a few mistakes they made, this was almost the perfect murder. Armed with the brothers' confession, the prosecution seemed to have an open and shut case in the early days of the trial. The defense had other ideas. We're not disputing where it happened, how it happened, who did it. We're not disputing when it happened. The only thing that you are going to have to focus on in this trial is why it happened. Facing such an emotionally charged defense, the prosecution team decided to take the opposite approach. We wanted to come across, at least in our case in chief, as being sort of um, Unemotional. Lead prosecutor Pam Bozanich planned to focus on the details without overselling her case. See, I can look at corner photos and eat lunch and it doesn't bother me. I didn't want the jurors to be like that. I wanted the jurors to still be able to look at the photographs and say, ooh, this is a bad thing. With the brothers on the stand and the photos in evidence, the prosecution attacked the idea that the parents were a threat the night of the killings, pointing out that near the bodies, police found bowls of strawberries and Eric's college applications. Can you see what that is that uh, was next to your mother, the, uh, the letters? Uh, how to enroll, uh, attend without obligation, some sort of parking, uh, registration, etc. And where is that from? I assume it's from UCLA. Now, if your mother had been planning to kill you, would she have been filling out your application for UCLA? Yes, we are. It was a high point in the trial for the prosecution. The prosecutor said, wait a minute, this is not what somebody would be doing if they were planning on killing their children. This is what parents would be doing if they had a normal, maybe a somewhat difficult relationship with the children. 
but certainly not parents who were planning on taking the lives of their own kids. Prosecutors probed another weakness in the self-defense claim. With their mother badly wounded, the brothers had reloaded. When you put the shotgun up against her left cheek and you pulled the trigger, did you love your mother? Yes. And was that an act of love, Mr. Menendez? There's confusion, fear. You were afraid of her at that point? What did you think she was going to do to you? At that point, I was... I wasn't consciously thinking anything in particular. I was just reacting. But, Mr. Menendez, you had to reload the shotgun in order to put that round into your mother's cheek, didn't you? Right. Prosecution says if you look at how this thing was played out, that they went out days in advance and bought their shotgun, it should suggest to you that this was part of a plan. The defense was hoping the jury would see it differently. That is one inference, okay? But it also has another inference, that it is what they said it was, preparing to defend themselves. Defense attorney Leslie Abramson. Both are things that have to be thought of, but the ultimate intention is different. The prosecution continued to build a case of premeditated murder. The evidence will show that the defendants really got away with their crime. They had meticulously picked up all the shotgun shells from the family room. Uh, they had buried the shotgun. And their star witness was Dr. Jerome Ozeal, Eric's therapist, and the man to whom the brothers confessed the killings three years ago. Eric said that he entered the room first, and I believe that he was... Uh, shooting at his uh, father, um, and then Lyle um, followed after him and um, basically, quote, Lyle finished off the job. Terry Moran covered the trial for Court TV. Well, Dr. Ozeal was on the stand for the prosecution for less than a day. His direct testimony lasted less than a day, and he was very cool. He's a super rational man. Knowing the therapist's testimony was crucial to the prosecution, the defense began hammering away at his credibility on the very first day of the trial. We will present evidence to you to prove that this man operates on his own agenda, that he has motives to lie about what he was told by the Menendez brothers, and that he has a track record of lying, manipulating, and controlling people for his own selfish purposes. And they went after him with everything they could find, just hurling epithets at him, hurling insults at him. Well, did you make the tape recording for the purpose of creating a false record so that you could use the tape to extort money out of the Menendez brothers? No, Mr. Bird, I did not. In an attempt to discredit the prosecution witness, the defense also called a former girlfriend, Judalon Smith, who described Ozeal as a monster. I do believe that he intends to kill me. I was very concerned about coming to this court because he would have knowledge that I would be here. And I have made sure that I have people around me at all times. In one of the trial's more bizarre terms, Ozeal's mistress, who first told police about the brother's confession, ended up testifying for the defense against her mild-mannered former lover. He sounds brutal. He sounds like a manipulator. He sounds like a man capable of lying. And so there are two Ozeals in this case. Regardless of Dr. Ozeal's credibility, a key moment in the trial came during the closing weeks when prosecutors won a long battle to have a tape of one of the therapist's sessions with the brothers played in the courtroom. The tapes were important for the prosecution because the jury was able to hear a different voice of Lyle Menendez, a different voice of Eric Menendez, a voice talking about the killing of their parents that sounded very different from the way they sounded on the stand, and a voice according to the prosecution that was describing this carefully planned and premeditated act of murder. What the tape does for the prosecution is show that Lyle and Eric Menendez, at that stage, just a couple of months after the killing, in talking with their therapist, in confidence, never mentioned sexual abuse. Where Lyle Menendez is heard saying that he feels his mother gave them the permission to kill her. You could hear an almost audible sigh go out from the jury box. With the tape in front of the jury, 
Prosecutor Pam Bozanich felt she had a strong case. It is icing on the icing on the case. I mean, it's important because it's their own words. It's important also because of the defense they presented. And it was interesting that we got the tape after they'd put on this whole defense. And then their experts have to come back and have to sort of, uh, <clears throat> well, uh, like, let me try to explain this now. The prosecution argued abuse was never a motive for the killing, offering a much simpler theory, greed. Shortly after the killings, Lyle Menendez began to send money. On September the 8th of 1989, 19 days after the killings, a life insurance policy which had been procured earlier by Jose Menendez was paid to the defendants. The policy cumulatively was for $650,000. Prosecutors pointed out that after the killing, the brothers had gone on a spending spree. Lyle bought a restaurant and a Porsche. Eric hired a tennis coach to help him turn pro. The attacks on the defense continued during rebuttal after they presented most of their case. The state called Lyle's ex-fiance, Jamie Pisarchik, to testify about research she had done for him while he was in jail. Could you describe the nature of the cases that you were asked to look up in Xerox for Lyle Menendez? Um, the cases were um, situations where children had gotten off um, after killing their parents. Just before closing arguments began, the defense suffered a major setback. The judge ruled that there was in fact no evidence that the parents were a threat to the brothers and that he would not give the jury the option of freeing the two on self-defense grounds. Now more than four years after that deceptive 911 call to the Beverly Hills Police, the fate of the two brothers rested with two juries. When we come back, we'll take you inside the jury room, meet some of the people who spent six months listening to the evidence, find out why the jury could not agree. Coming up, hear from those who sat in the jury box. What was a typical day of deliberation? And were they ever close to reaching a verdict? Chances are you probably already have an opinion about the Menendez case. Over the past six months, Court TV has been inundated with calls. Opinions pretty much divided. Court TV's viewer call in line got more than 6,000 comments since the Menendez trial began in July. We're talking about two people who are the scum of the earth. When Court TV brought some of their viewers together, they found some pretty unshakable opinions. If my parents abused me in a way that I believe Eric was abused, I would hope that I would have killed them a lot sooner. Oh, oh my God. Next on Dateline, the actual Menendez jurors. How did they reach their decision? From Los Angeles, here again is Stone Phillips. As the jurors began deliberating, there were some important legal issues at stake. Could admitted killers claim they were in fact victims? Could the battered wife defense apply to abused children? The judge's instructions seemed to preclude an acquittal. He gave the jurors four options. The most serious, first degree murder, meaning the killings were premeditated. A conviction could lead to the gas chamber. Second degree murder, murder without premeditation. Voluntary manslaughter, defined as killing someone without malice or in the honest but unreasonable belief that they had to defend themselves against imminent peril. The least serious option, involuntary manslaughter, an unintentional killing. This verdict could have set the brothers free with time served. By this time, you may know how you would have voted, but you may be surprised how the actual jurors formed their opinions. The jury believes there is no reasonable probability of our reaching a verdict or verdicts without violence to our individual judgments. The trial that began with two juries ended with both badly divided. We just totally just split. We just split equally. It was very difficult for us. Eric's jury split early and evenly along gender lines. The men arguing for murder, the women holding firm for manslaughter. For 19 days, they were deadlocked. The atmosphere in the jury room so tense that by the end, they were shouting at each other, the women accusing the men of sexism and homophobia. I'm glad I was in my jury. <laughs> Lyle's jury stayed at it for a record 25 days, the jurors shifting positions frequently as they worked in vain for a verdict. 
Sometimes it was seven to five for a second degree. Sometimes it was nine to three for voluntary manslaughter. Over the weekend, I talked with four members of Lyle's jury. Three who argued for manslaughter, one who voted for murder. What was the prosecution's finest moment in this trial, do you think? The pictures. The pictures at the crime scene? Uh-huh, the crime scene. The autopsy pictures. We couldn't deny the photographs. It happened. I mean, some people in our jury room wanted those photos up every day so that we would have to look at them. That was ruled down. We could look at them if we wanted to. And we so you decided around. not to post them in the room? Right, right, that we had to stare at them every day. They'd be nowhere. The jury was profoundly affected by the prosecution's gruesome pictures and by the Dr. brothers' tape-recorded confession to their therapist, said, Dr. Jerome Ozeal. While the defense claimed the confession was made under questionable circumstances, some jurors felt it spoke for itself. I don't think he put Lyle under a tremendous lot of stress to be able to get him to talk on tape and confess to um, the killings, and Lyle knew exactly what he wanted to say about um, the murder. But it was here that for many jurors, the prosecution's case began to fall short as they started to focus on the character of the man who made the tape. Not very credible. For <laughs> being kind. These jurors told us they agreed with the defense that the doctor was unethical, unbelievable, and may have been trying to blackmail the brothers when he taped their confession. Was there a lot of debate and discussion about that? Was that a, a central point? Yes. Yes, especially at the beginning. Yeah. We dissected practically every word of that or every page. And what were people listening for? The tone of voice? The... The words planning. You know, they planned it or let Eric sleep on it. Uh, sometimes very damning. Um, words if you just took those words out but i think you have to take everything that was involved in why that tape was made and had it be considered what about the fact that although they confessed to the killings on that tape recording there was no mention of abuse or fear for their lives being the motivation we definitely we discussed, it. discussed it a lot um but there was a lot of there was a lot of um evidence provided again by various people that uh, they were um, brought up that you don't you don't talk about anything you covered up everything you lied about everything so I think it would be very difficult for them to talk about that on the stand Lyle found it very difficult to talk about reloading his shotgun to finish off his badly wounded mother what did you do after you reloaded I ran around and shot my mom Prosecutors said that showed the brothers were not acting in self-defense. But these jurors felt that Lyle had been so traumatized by the shootings, he might not have remembered exactly what happened. What did the jury make of the fact that Lyle reloaded the gun that night? It was disgust. It was disgust. Um, not, I, I don't know. It's not even really sure that that happened. Even though Lyle... Even though Lyle said he reloaded, you... Well, but I, um, I got the impression that Lyle wasn't real sure of all of the events. One point the prosecution hammered away at repeatedly was the motive. It was greed, they said. And for evidence, they pointed to the brothers' spending spree right after the shootings. But these jurors said the brothers didn't have to kill their parents to spend their money. Yeah, they, they always did it all the time. Huge limits. Yeah. And even this juror, who voted for murder, agreed that on this point, the prosecution hadn't been convincing. You think greed, greed was a factor, but not yeah, the not main the reason. main factor. No. It was, you have his own control over his own life. And not because he was afraid of his dad. Ultimately, it was that issue, why the brothers killed their parents, on which the trial turned. 
The defense claimed that the brothers killed because they felt they were in imminent danger from their parents. If jurors accepted that the brothers feared for their lives, then they were instructed to vote for manslaughter. Did you believe that the brothers were not only victims of abuse, but feared for their lives that night? I did. I did. I did. All three of you did. Mm -hmm. What was the critical piece of the puzzle that, that led you to believe that? There were witnesses that had nothing to gain by saying the things they said. They convinced me that uh, the home that these men grew up in, I could certainly believe that they thought their parents could absolutely do anything and not have to pay for it. As for those college applications found at the crime scene, the prosecution said that showed the parents weren't planning on killing the brothers. These jurors said all that counted was what was in the brothers' minds. We don't to kill believe the son. that they were We're planning, planning on murdering them. But we think Lyle believed that they were. And that's the difference. Well, it was critical, critical in all of your minds that you, that you believed that they believed they were going to be killed. Correct. Yes. Even jurors who didn't believe that fear was a factor agreed that the defense had won the point. You say fear was a brilliant defense because you can't, it was. You can't yes. disprove it. That's right. But you didn't buy it. No. They were in that much fear. He just didn't back. They didn't choose to do that. You didn't want to do that. He was. He got it. Well, this is an implied of that. This is it. Tied him off to. To believe that fear was behind the killings, jurors had to fundamentally agree with the defense's version of life as a member of the Menendez family. I think Jose was always playing games, mental games, with Lyle, and I think he knew he had Eric under control, and Jose knew how to push buttons, and he pushed them to the limit, and he just pushed one too many. In your mind, is Lyle an evil young man who was halfway home getting away with murder? He learned a lot from his dad. Uh, just like his dad. If you want to believe his dad was evil, then Lyle's evil. Like, like father, like, like son. That's right, like father, like son. These then were the issues that divided the jurors. And in the last days of the deliberations, Lyle's jury struggled one last time to reach common ground. A compromise verdict was proposed. Manslaughter and the killing of Jose a murder conviction for the death of Kitty. It was tempting. Yeah, it was. But tempting. I can do it. Yeah. If I was on trial for whatever, I would want to make a bargain compromise <laughs> with my life. In the end, they came in with nothing at all. The prosecutor says you sent the wrong message. That children can kill their parents and the punishment will be neither swift nor certain. How you fond of that? I wasn't concerned with public opinion when I made my decision. I feel like I was following the law. I feel the same way. We could not take what was going to happen, uh, what the outcome was. That was not to be our consideration. So we didn't. You just don't kill your parents. If Judy or Jose uh, was at them at a point where they were going to go ahead and and stab them, shoot them, or whatever, then I can see them defending themselves. But none of that happened. And the way they just decided, well, we're just going to take them out, and we're tired of them, we feel I don't think that was right at all. It was horrible. Gruesome killing, defendants who admittedly lied, covered up, and ultimately confessed. And yet, no verdict. Some people will ask, what more does it take? Proof beyond a reasonable doubt. The law. The law. 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 (laughs) With no verdict the juries could agree on, Lyle and Eric Menendez are in jail tonight. And it could cost taxpayers as much as a million dollars to retry them. In a moment, legal experts look at the case. What went wrong? What does it say about the criminal justice system? And what does it mean to future cases? 
Coming up, what's next in the Menendez case? Insights from Court TV's Cynthia McFadden and Jack Ford. Plus, the latest on Tanya Harding. What have attorneys noticed about the Menendez trial? With me now are two who watched the trial from close up. Cynthia McFadden anchored much of Court TV's gavel-to-gavel -gavel coverage. And Jack Ford, NBC's legal correspondent, also an anchor for Court TV. Jack, some people call this the it's not my fault defense, where the, the, the crime is, is, is obvious, yeah. and yet the defense is, but there were circumstances, of, and therefore you cannot blame me. You used to see, or at least the perceptions were, that more trials were a whodunit. Okay, somebody died, let you, the jury, figure out who did it. We're seeing now a great number of cases where everybody's walked in the courtroom and the defendants have said, you know what, you're right, I did it. But let me tell you why I did it. I, excuse, I think there's something else going on here. I think there are more and more psychological reasons that we understand about why people do what they do. Whether or not we want those psychological reasons to be legal excuses is something the legal system hasn't dealt with yet. And what we're seeing in the Menendez trials and trials like the Menendez trial are people, regular people, jurors, trying to figure out whether or not maybe this psychological truth has any legal merit. One of the things you see sometimes when a defense becomes popular, in the sense it can become a defense du jour, you know, people say, well, I like this, this sounds good and it seemed to work with somebody else, so maybe I'll try it myself. Did the prosecution make some obvious mistakes? The defendants were very much alive in the courtroom, but the victims weren't. The defendants took the stand and we saw their pain, we saw their emotion, we saw what they had been through. I think what the prosecution failed to do was to bring Kitty and Jose Menendez into that courtroom with the same passion, with the same understanding, and with the same reality that the brothers got there. The defense comes in here and they essentially adopt the, the old John Wayne, he needed killing defense. He's a bad guy, he needed killing. But how, if you're the prosecutor, you're going to say, what does that mean about Kitty Menendez? She needed killing too because she happened to have been married to a, an, an evil man. So they need somehow to reconstruct in the courtroom, most importantly, Kitty Menendez, but also to some extent, Jose Menendez, so they can come back and say, firstly, in our society, we don't allow this, he needed killing. And secondly, there is no reason at all why this woman gets blown away by her own children with shotguns. Bottom line, did the system work? When you spend millions of dollars, you take 12 people, actually more than that, 24 jurors plus the alternates out of their lives for six months. You call 101 witnesses, you have over 400 exhibits, and at the end of the day, we still don't have an outcome. I'm not sure that means the system is working. We take 12 people off the street and we say, you listen to everything and you come back and tell us what you think. And when 12 people come back and say, we're not convinced one way or the other. To me, that says the system did work. They didn't feel forced to decide something when they truly and genuinely couldn't make up their mind. So we might not like it, and it might be very expensive, but to me, it says it worked. Thank you, Cynthia and Jack. Well, the prosecution has already vowed to retry the Menendez brothers, but it won't be cheap, and it won't be easy. Here's Court TV's Terry Moran. We have an ethical, a professional, and moral responsibility to go forward with this case as a first-degree murder case. Only hours after the mistrial was declared, L.A. District Attorney Gil Garcetti said he was ready to try the case again. This may cost a million dollars, and be damned with how much money it's going to cost. We're going to seek justice in this case. New jury selection could begin as early as May, but at least one defense attorney predicts another hung jury. I think that the complexity of this case and the fact that it draws on individual life experiences makes this a case which will probably never result in a unanimous verdict. If the prosecution is ever to succeed, it will have to discredit the brothers' charges of sexual abuse, something to the surprise of several jurors they failed to do last time. But I expected the prosecution to have a witness that would say the opposite. And maybe that was part of the reason why they did not prove their case. If the case is retried, chances are you won't see the same prosecution team. I would rather eat ground glass for a year than do this trial again. Next, the latest twist in the Tanya Harding story. Plus, Double Jeopardy, Dateline's Picture of the Week. And now 
Now the latest on Tanya Harding after a day of dramatic rapid-fire development. The skater's ex-husband pleaded guilty to reduce charges. In exchange, he'll testify against her. His attorney said Harding personally approved the attack on Nancy Kerrigan, saying, let's go for it. Harding's lawyer insisted on her innocence and said the media covering the story was easily manipulated and frequently uninformed. And U.S. skating officials began meeting to determine what action, if any, to take against Harding. Standing by with the very latest now is NBC News' David Bloom. David, can skating officials count on the FBI to have anything definitive for them to base this decision on? The answer, Jane, in all likelihood is no. What you saw today when the statements of Jeff DeLuley and Tanya Harding were released from the FBI was that there was a lot of circumstantial evidence as well as the allegations of people like DeLuley, the ex-husband of Tanya Harding and her bodyguard, Sean Eckert, but nothing concrete, no smoking gun, so to speak. So even though today was a day that looked like nothing but bad news for Tanya, in a way, maybe it makes it more likely she's going to go to Norway. Well, absolutely. If the U.S. Olympic Committee is waiting for the Portland prosecutors to charge Tanya Harding in this case, they may have weeks to wait, which means that it might ultimately be the U.S. Olympic Committee meeting in Norway, meeting in Lillehammer, that has to make that decision just right before the games are scheduled to begin for the figure skater. Remarkable story. Thank you, David. There is one thing in the Menendez case that's guaranteed, and it brings us to our picture of the week. Or should we say motion picture? There will be two made-for-TV movies, one by CBS and one by Fox. The mother, Kitty Menendez, will be portrayed by Jill Clayburgh and Beverly D'Angelo. The father, Jose Menendez, will be played by James Ferentino and Edward James Olmos. The brothers will be played by lesser knowns, Lyle by Billy Warlock and Damian Chapa, and Eric by David Barone and Travis Fine. Mr. Fine can bring a special insight to this role because of his wife. Before they met, she dated a rich young man from Beverly Hills. His name, Eric Menendez. That's it from Los Angeles. I'll see you next week. Jane, good night. Good night, Stone. Tomorrow on Now with Tom Brokaw and Katie Couric. Some call her Eric Menendez's secret weapon, attorney Leslie Abramson. A Maria Shriver profile. I'm Jane Pauley. For everyone here at Dateline, good night. For a transcript, call 1-800-777-TAP.